This week on the Power Play Show, Thomas Berry once quoted, the greater the diversity, the greater the perfection. My guest this week has spent her career seeking that perfection. Rosa Rodriguez Williams' work has transcended community-based organizations, cultural institutions, and higher education. Our conversation on belonging, inclusion, and justice, coming up next on The Power Play Show. From the studios at Hull Bay Productions, this is Season 3 of The Power Play Show. Now, here's Tonya McGrath. Welcome to The Power Play Show. I'm Tonya McGrath. Rosa Rodriguez Williams has devoted her life and career to help build communities where everyone feels they can fully participate, create, learn, engage, and thrive. She is committed to and passionate about not only advancing organizational diversity and inclusion practices, but also on the development and uplifting of its people. Currently, Rosa is the Executive Director of the Office of Institutional Diversity and Inclusion at Northeastern University, whose mission is to value and celebrate diversity in all its forms. Prior to her current position, Rosa was the inaugural Senior Director of Belonging and Inclusion at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, where she assessed equity pressure points, built capacity, and facilitated solutions for departments across the museum the first of its kind position at the esteemed institution. She has dedicated her entire career ensuring that everyone, particularly those in marginalized populations feel included, welcomed and accepted. Rosa Rodriguez Williams, welcome to the Power Play Show. Thank you, I'm so excited to be here. Um, I was just talking to you offline on how this is my first sort of podcast um and so i'm so grateful that you have invited me on and that i get to talk about the work that i'm incredibly passionate about and and sort of you know i think um as a kid you don't think about that this is what you're going to be doing with your life and so it's great to sort of share my story and my work with with your um audience and I want to start actually as a kid because you are originally from Puerto Rico and you moved to Massachusetts when you were about eight years old. Was there anything about your childhood that sparked your passion for diversity and inclusion? Um, I think perhaps all of it. Um, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I was born in Puerto Rico. I came here when I was eight years old. Um, and so I moved from sort of these beautiful beaches to the inner city, Lawrence, Massachusetts, where it was cold. We didn't really have family. We didn't know anyone. And so um, things were definitely different and they felt different. I think if I was to mark um, a situation or something that sort of um, shaped me um, in the work that I do um, is, you know, when I was younger, I was um, driving home uh, from North Andover with my brother. And so, you know, Lawrence and North Andover are, are sort of, um, they border each other. Um, North Andover being the more affluent mm -hmm. um, uh, community, Lawrence being inner city, you know, um, poor um, immigrant. Um, community that's where I was from and so we're driving home my brother is Afro Latino his skin is dark same parents um, my dad my dad has dark skin as well and I am as fair as they come and so you know we were driving home together and we get pulled over by the police mm -hmm. the treatment between um, what happened to my brother he got sort of thrown to the hood of the car asked to um, uh, you know uh, exit the vehicle and I was sort of my door was opened. I was asked if I was there um, because I wanted to be. It's actually the words that were used. And, and so I, I thought to myself, that's, you know, that's my brother. And I, I think I even said that to, to the police officer. Um, of course, they searched them, nothing came up. And so that was sort of something that really shaped my thinking um, and my work um, in terms of equity work, um, it, it, coming real face to face you know, coming from a, a multiracial family, coming face to face with anti-black um, uh, racism um, at the age of, I think I was 14 or so, um, was impactful um, for me, but also for my brother and my family and sort of began sort of my thinking and shaping um, to, to what I wanted to do. Of course, at the time, I didn't know that that was the case. Mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, and so, you know, activism sort of began in me at that early age. So I must imagine that that particular experience must have been very frightening for you. And I wonder how much it did kind of impact your relationship, not only with your brother, but how you kind of navigated in the Lawrence community. I, I, I used to work up in the uh, Andover, North and area. So I, I know the proximity um, of Lawrence to that area. Um, but it, I would imagine that your story that happened to you and your brother was happening all over the place, particularly in that particular um, region. Did you have communication with other friends or peers at your age about what was going on? Yeah, you know, I, I, I think I may have sort of unpacked it with my sister a little bit, um, but it was something that, you know, was happening within our community anyway. There were things, these were the kinds of things that my friends and I were sort of experiencing in the school system, specifically with our teachers um, and the expectation they had of, of us, right? Um, I, I remember when I was applying to college, um, my guidance counselor, I, I sort of gave her my list and she says, you know, these, these are really rich schools for you. Girls like you don't go to these types of colleges. And so, you know, it, it sort of, um, it was something that just continued to happen. And it was something that we just, well, can you believe um, um, so-and-so said this to me? Um, and so, you know, I, 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 there was no unpacking, there was no camera phones, there was no video. I can imagine, right, if, if that happened um, to, to me and, and my brother now, you know, I would take out my phone and begin to record. And, um, and so back then we didn't have those things, right? And so the things that we're seeing now were definitely happening when we were growing up. We just didn't have sort of that voice or felt that we had sort of that outlet or that voice of people that would come and sort of um, reach out to us and help us sort of unpack it, but also, um, you know, uh, uh, complain about it and, and, and sort of bring it higher into uh, places where they could help us, um, and which is some of the work that, you know, I, I get to do now. Your husband, who I went to high school with, and I went to a school in an affluent neighborhood that was ironically kind of surrounded by other Boston inner city um, uh, neighborhoods. And I remember as many of the students in my um, class in, in school at the time, students of color, felt as though we were always kind of marginalized and that we didn't belong there. Um, and so for me, my voice kind of started very early in my life, being outspoken, being an advocate. When did you find your voice? When was it that you decided that, you know what, I need to start to speak about these issues um, and to kind of explore what this means in a general, in a, in a greater sense, I should say. Yeah, so I, in high school, I went to an all girls Catholic high school. Um, and I was um, one of the few, uh, you know, students of color, racialized um, uh, students, marginalized students. Um, and, and so I couldn't find my voice there. It was too hard for me, too new for me to sort of, and I wanted to fit in, right? And in order to belong, you sort of, um, I have, and, and, I, and I understand my privilege with having sort of my skin color, um, which is a conversation in itself to be had within the Latino community that I am always sort of championing and taught, wanting to talk about is sort of that, that privilege that we still carry. And in all my privilege, I was able to sort of, you know, pass and find friends and create that community. It wasn't until I went to UMass Amherst where I really found sort of mi gente, my people, my community, um, you know, the, uh, the uh, black student groups, the Latino student groups we worked, you know, it was sort of, we worked together. It was really um, a united front. Um, and we began to do activism. And that's where sort of my passion um, for the work that I do really sparked. Um, I remember we took over a building, the controller's office, because we wanted Latino studies programs. Um, we wanted an African-American studies program at UMass Amherst at the time. And so 
you know, we just found our voice in that way. And we spoke up every chance we got. And it's, I think back then it was a little easier because you sort of had this group of people that you knew were gonna stand up with you. Um, and so that was sort of my training ground. I, I love to, you know, we wrote proposals, we uh, did conferences, we found scholarship money for our friends. You know, we we just really rallied and, and um, it, it's a beautiful time in my life. Um, I have dear friends that still um, I keep in touch with and that continue to do very similar work that, that I do um, within their own communities. Yeah, so it was UMass Amherst, that, that beautiful place that will always have sort of this special place in my heart because that's really where I found my voice, my identity, who I was, was able to unpack all of the things that I had experienced, um, that my family had experienced, um, and made it make sense. And finally say, you know, this is not okay, and I want better for my children and my children's children. And who were some of your role models at that time that helped shape your passion for this kind of change? So there's this um, um, woman, she's actually in the arts. Um, she was part of the Puerto Rican Poets Cafe at the time. Her name is Dr. Marta Moreno Vega. And um, she runs, I think it's the Puerto Rican Cultural Center um, in New York City right now. And she does phenomenal work around um, the arts and, um, and diversity and inclusion and artists and, and the need and the need and the right that we have as a human beings to be part of the arts. Um, and so back then she was just an activist. Um, she was part of, um, um, you know, activist groups. And so um, we would bring her to campus and she would meet with us and she would, you know, do her poetry. Um, and she was just sort of that person that we saw as an adult who was doing the work that who was helping us sort of find our way in our voice um, that was empowering us um, to say and speak and do the things that we knew were right to do mm -hmm. um, that we knew that we were sort of um, and I don't think we had the language back then but that we were we were swimming in a white supremacist culture um, everywhere that we looked, it was sort of built in into every system and every interaction and even within ourselves, how complicit we are. Right. I remember yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm sort of ashamed of sort of how complicit I was in high school because I just, you know, we, we shut our mouths just to get along. And, mm -hmm. and so we don't want to be the difficult one. We don't want to be the one that's always bringing that up. And we don't want to sort of be labeled that person. That's and right. So, you know, we, we walk in sort of this complicity. Um, and so, you know, I, I think because she was so strong and powerful for my friends and I, we were just like, yeah, we can do that too. And it's okay to lift our voices up, even if we're going to get labeled in this way. Um, you know, some of us were quiet disruptors and some of us were just, we just need to burn it all down. Um, and so I think we all balanced each other well, but Marta Moreno Vega is um, an outstanding, um, you know, public figure and activist that um, definitely fueled my passion for this work. I want to fast forward now to adulthood. You're you're done with college, and when you first entered into your field, what do you recall as being some of the more pressing issues when it comes to diversity and inclusion then? And then later on, we'll get to what you're dealing with now. But what were some of the pressing issues then? Um, when I was growing up. No, after so we're after college and when you first entered your your profession yeah. your career in diversity and inclusion what were you noticing then that maybe has changed now or is still the same unfortunately talk about that a bit i think i think the issues then are the issues now um, I think we have absolutely made strides in terms of, you know, um, policies and initiatives that 
um, that are in place in, in some organizations and some um, uh, industries and, and you know even at museums etc to really you know be reflective about what they're doing um, and and bring in more diversity um, and more diverse voices and perspectives and, and that's wonderful but I think the work itself um, because we've sort of um, just done it from the surface where um, I think DEI then, um, and even some now in terms of our practice um, has been sort of how do we help people survive in this culture? You know, let's give them an, uh, an employee resource group where they can find community. Let's um, help them deal with microaggressions from their managers. Let's, and so it's like, how do we bring more diverse um, voices and people into an organization and help them survive? I think what I think, um, if I may just jump into the now, because <laughs> I'm sort of living in it, so it's sort of where I'm, I'm coming from in terms of my approach is you know it's not about helping um, folks of color survive it's about dismantling the structures that do not allow us to be um, who we are to bring our full voices and self to spaces that we're in um, right to make a mark to have an opinion um, um, and to share those opinions right it's not only the business case for diversity which we've heard for years it's about the moral case. If you have a business case without a moral case that focuses on justice and dignity, right, um, and righteousness, um, then what you're doing is really, um, I like to say, irresponsible of an organization to just continue to bring voices for there to be sort of this revolving door and harmful, um, harmful practice to individuals that you are telling that you want in a space. So you, you touched on this just a little bit, but talk about your definition of diversity and inclusion and has it changed over the course of your career? Um, I think I think as the field has evolved, I think new sort of words and focus um, have come into play. You know, sometimes folks talk about diversity, equity, inclusion. Sometimes folks say diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging. Um, justice, et cetera. And, and so it depends on sort of um, what, what your organization is labeling it or what you're um, calling it. But for me, you know, I, I, I look at it in ways of um, uh, diversity is sort of the numbers game, right? Uh, organizations want to bring a certain amount of folks of color, folks of marginalized identities, um, gender identities, et cetera. Um, into their space. You know, for me, inclusion is um, really looking at the policies and the practices that create sort of that um, environment for belonging, um, really looking at dismantling things that are barriers to people being part of your community, people being really engaging with um, with um, the staff and the organization and contributing in ways that they feel safe, that they can thrive and they feel like they can create. And, and, and sort of that's the sense of belonging. For me, belonging is always the, um, the goal, um, that if you're gonna do all of these sort of things is so that you can end up with um, this community of belonging where everybody feels seen. Um, and, you know, I think, I think one of my, um, I want to say pet peeves of 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 my work, but I would say um, that that sort of I'm seeing now within DEI conversations is that we use the word all, where all can be seen and um, um, you know feel like they belong, and that's true. Um, but for me, let's talk about what the all really means. Mm -hmm. You know, DEI work is not about maintaining a status quo for, you know, sort of our, our, our white um, colleagues to, to feel seen. They feel seen all the time. <laughs> you know, it, it's part of sort of their, their privilege. For me, the all is the um, folks that have not felt like they belong. Um, specifically around the black community, 
um, um, and Latino community. Um, for me, that is the all that I am most focused on. That is the all that I work um, for um, to sort of dismantle those barriers for folks of, 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 of black and brown folks that are just trying to make their way in these organizations. Um, you know, I said to one of my uh, supervisors, um, in one of the organizations that I worked in, that you're having folks of color come in, fill your status quo, um, put in their sweat labor into um, the work that they're doing, and then they end up being microaggressed and, mm -hmm. and by their managers and being in these spaces when they have given you sort of their their sweat equity um, and giving you the best of them to just be mistreated. And I said, these two things don't come together. Mm -hmm. um, these two things um, don't make sense to me. And so this is where where our work is. And, and you know, he sort of agreed um, in, in that. Um, I think a lot of organizations always talk about um, this is hard work and um, you know, we need to wait for, and waiting in using the word hard work, those are all um, sort of uh, come from a place of privilege. Yeah. That there are people that can't wait, um, but there are some of us who have been waiting for a really long time um, that need the opportunities, um, not because, you know, you're sort of, oh, you know, let's give this person an opportunity. No, it's about, um, you know, sort of, this is deserving of it um and it's not sort of a gift as, as some people sort of um, some organizations tend to frame it but that it's actually um something that is deserved and 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 should be given because it, they have worked for it right that's oh my gosh i i could talk to you forever we need to take a quick break more with rosa rodriguez williams when we continue you're listening to the power of play show Hi, I'm Tonya McGrath, producer and director of the upcoming film documentary, More Than Our Skin. Right, then there's no problem. When I started developing this film, it was about the lives of five women living with the autoimmune disease vitiligo. The disease was a construct in which I would come to understand what living with their condition was like for each of them. But after I met these extraordinary women, something happened. Valerie, Millicent, Alicia, Patricia, and Katrina made me realize that each of us is simply looking to be loved for who we truly are. They invited me into their homes and their worlds, shared their peaks and valleys, then revealed to me how they found their true purpose. Getting to know these women, it soon became apparent, was more than their personal stories and hardships. It was discovering their journeys of what truly matters most, their beauty isn't defined by skin creams or makeup or how the world defines them. They have been given an opportunity to realize themselves on their own terms and in so doing, found a deeper aspect of themselves and what real beauty is. If we can look beyond imperfections to cultivate the depth and dimension of our souls, we just may find the eternal quality of our being. We are much more than our skin. Michelangelo once wrote, what spirit is so empty and blind that it cannot recognize the fact that the foot is more noble than the shoe and the skin more beautiful than the garment with which it is clothed. I invite you to visit More Than Our Skin and learn about the stories of these five amazing women, the production crew behind the making of this film, and to consider making a donation to help this film to its completion. Our goal is simple. We want the audience, you, to see what's behind the skin and know that you can make a difference now by seeing, hearing, and loving the person behind their spots. I know I have, and I hope you will too. Thank you. We're back with my guest, Rosa Rodriguez Williams. There's a line that I've always loved that sums it up for me. 
And that line is diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance. Can you dissect this for our audience in, in the, the difference between the two? Yeah, I mean, it's I think we've been talking a little bit about it, sort of those numbers games of inviting folks to your organization, um, but then, you know, not asking them for to dance for their input for their um, to be engaged in a way that they're comfortable in to not fit into the mold of your sort of thinking around professionalism, but that they can define that for themselves. You know, as we think about, you know, the trans community um, and bringing their full self to their work, um, we think about the Crown Act um, and how, you know, black women for years have been um, sort of uh, seeing their hair as not being a professional. Um, you know, that to me is me being asked to dance. It's sort of come as you are, be who you are, um, engage in the way that you want to engage and contribute to um, this sort of um, uh, innovation economy that it's so much better because there are diverse perspectives in it. Yeah, I, that's always just been something that was like mind blowing to me when I heard that phrase, because it, it does really kind of speak to the truth. And, and you alluded to this a few times about the numbers versus the decision makings. You know, I, I grew up in a newsroom, so, it you know, I could count on less than one hand how many editors in of color that we had making decisions about the stories that we told and you know i i see some of the news stories that go out now and i'm wondering if these newsrooms are any different you know yeah. we see the reporters in front of the camera but behind the camera is where all the decisions get made and um so I, you know, I, I yeah. still think that we have so much, and we always keep saying this all the time, we have so much work to do, but it, it yeah. is really, really true. Yeah, I've heard um, sort of an extra step to that is that belonging is actually given um, a sort of charge of the playlist or, you know, the auxiliary cable um, where you can actually, you know, play the music that you want to hear. That's awesome. You were hired at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston as the Senior Director of Belonging and Inclusion, the first position of this kind at the MFA. Was this in response to an incident where students from the Helen Davis Leadership Academy Charter School in Dorchester alleged they were profiled and harassed by MFA staff? And what was your task in this role when you were at the MFA? Yeah, you know, um, the MFA uh, was, I, I learned so much at the MFA and, and I will say that the folks that work there, the curators and, and some of the staff, especially my staff, <laughs> you know, they're just incredible, incredible people. Um, the role, the senior director role, I, I, I think you know Makiba McCreary, who is now the president of the New Commonwealth Fund. I love her to pieces, learned so much from her. Um, she um, was actually my boss at the time. She was the um, chief of learning and community engagement. Um, and so she had been working prior to the Davis Leadership Academy um, incident with um, Matthew Teitelmaw, the director at the time. So although this, the, the position itself was in the works, I think post that, post George Floyd, um, uh, you know, the, the position was sort of precipitated and, and sort of had sort of a, a more of a vision of what, um, uh, you know, Makiba and Matthew at the time um, wanted it to do. Um, I came in um, in uh, September 2020 um, and my role was specifically around um, the visitor experience. And so I was very inward focused, but also outward focused um, to sort of look at data, look at the visitor experience, look at who we weren't serving um, and work with cur curators and folks from across the museum to, um, um, to take sort of a DI approach to the practice that they, that they were, um, uh, or how they were engaging with, the, with their work and, and practicing uh, their curatorial interpretation and other things. Um, uh, there, it was a time of building um, when I got to the museum, there was really no infrastructure 
for the work. Um, and so Makiba and I worked really closely in, at, at the beginning before she moved on to the new Commonwealth Fund to sort of um, define what this role would be, what the department would do. And I think um, as I was leaving and looking back at some of the work that I did, um, it was really great to sort of build that department um, to um, work with curators around um, decolonization frameworks and having conversations of what does um, inclusion mean at the museum, what does inclusion mean in interpretation, and sort of really um, um, defining inclusive interpretive practice as well. And so, you know, there were, there were lots of new things and policies that were sort of um, um, created. Um, and now I leave it for somebody else to come in and, and sort of build on that. You know, it, it's astonishing the number of museums that we have in the Boston area that are mirrored right up against these very diverse communities. The MFA Isabella Stewart Garden Museum, we have the Children's Museum, we have the Museum of Science. And I remember reading a, a report at the time, probably very shortly after the Davis Leadership Academy incident, where it was astonishing the lack of diversity when it came to the visitors of the museum. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, is this, we, we understand, you know, what these institutions are, but how, in your opinion, can we do a better job at including the communities that are just like right around these, these major institutions? Yeah, you know, I think that was um, some of that was part of my work um, at the at the MFA. Um, we have a, a, a learning and community engagement department that is charged with do we. The museum <laughs> has a learning and community engagement department um, that you know is charged with doing that work with the community um, and being present, um, not only sort of thinking with, you know, sort of bringing people in, but bringing the museum out as well and engaging in the day-to-day -day sort of community events and things that are happening. You know, I think in order, I've always said this: in order to build trust, we needed to leave. Um, sort of those um, ancient <laughs> double doors in the front um, and engage with our community where they are. Um, uh, part of that was um, having conversations that are called city talks that we were starting to sort of uh, roll out. The Boston Foundation had given us a grant um, to roll some of these out um, specifically around exhibitions. Mm -hmm. um, there's one coming up um, that I work, got to work on um, a lot before I left, which is the Obama portraits are coming to the MFA. And it's sort of an opportunity for us to really, for the MFA to really engage um, with the community. And so there was a, um, a community portrait project. There are city talks that are happening around that, um, the state. So there's one in Lowell and there's going to be a few in Boston. Um, to engage the community in conversation. Um, and so that's sort of one area. It's sort of how do we engage the community outside of our doors by creating trust? And, and trust comes from, you know, sort of um, being consistent and doing what you say you're going to do um, and doing that consistently outside of the MFA um, so that folks will come in. And then um, the other side of this, we, we um, were doing um, a table of voices at the time where uh, we were bringing community voices in to um, 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 inform um, public programs, to inform exhibitions. And so for me, I saw sort of the gallery, um, the special exhibition collections um, um, and, and sort of the galleries as sort of this triangle of interpretation, which is the folks who write the words that are on the wall yeah. in, the, in the stories that are told about certain objects. Um, uh, so it was interpretation, table of voices, and sort of um, evaluation. Um, and sort of this information comes together to sort of create inclusion um, and give it sort of that DEI lens because we're looking at it from different directions. And so that was another sort of practice that we were engaging and playing around with. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, it's about what you see in 
the museum. Mm. Um, you know, what, who's in the walls? Um, you know, some of the anecdotal data that was part of my work was that folks from um, underrepresented communities, specifically Black and Latinos, um, we wanted, we cared about story, justice, and identity. And if these things weren't on our walls, if these things weren't part of the narratives and the stories, people were just not interested in coming and being part of it. Um, also safety of the space. We realized that people were coming, you know, were taking risks coming to that space because of the history that it has. Um, and so we were engaging with our frontline staff to provide culturally responsive training. Um, so anyway, there were all of these sort of different mm -hmm. things that we were engaging in so that we can engage the community, um, not only to bring them in, but to give them sort of the aux cable so that they can play their music as well. The Basquiat exhibit was phenomenal. And um, Rob Stahl, uh, also Brookline High alum. Oh my gosh, he's my friend. Hey, <laughs> yes, Rob. so, and he <laughs> got to don the facade of the MFA, the first ever black artist in Boston to do so. So that was, that was pretty uh, remarkable. You are now back at Northeastern, heading up the Office of Institutional Diversity and Inclusion. What type of work are you hoping to do in this new role? You know, um, I am now centralized. I spent 13 years here at, at, at Northeastern as the director of the Latinx Student Cultural Center um, before going to the MFA. And so now I'm back to sort of looking at the totality of the global um, system that is Northeastern University. And some of my work here will be specifically around um, uh, workforce development, um, talent, um, talent acquisition, um, and uh, supplier diversity uh, specifically. But we'll be working with sort of the academic side of the house and sort of faculty diversity, um, also with um, student success and diversity, um, looking at programs, looking at um, um, curriculums, developing trainings with, you know, sort of my, my staff here as well, and sort of overseeing some of all of those things. Um, Northeastern is a, in, in, it's a huge institution. It, it has um, many campuses outside of here and overseas. And so, you know, it's really, um, I've been here a month and it's just really sort of re um, acclimating myself with the space and with the new sort of work um, that, I ha that I'm sort of charged in doing. That's, it's great. And, you know, I think that your contributions and your work and everything you're doing just has to be applauded because I know how hard and how possibly frustrating the work can be at some times, but I do applaud you for your efforts. Before I let you go, my last question is, what's the most important thing you want people to understand about the importance of diversity and inclusion in the workplace, in school, anywhere they go what's what's something that's very important that people really need to know i think um people need to know that if someone does not feel like they belong in an institution um, um, that you are part of that it is your responsibility um, to engage in the work um, when someone says northeastern university is not um, inclusive um, that includes me because I work here and it's part of my work. Um, somebody said at the MFA, you know, there's, it's not a separate thing. I think, um, I think it's essentially for us to not see the work as separate, but that it is part of regular business, right? It's how we conduct business is part of how we approach our, um, um, our, our, our work every day. Um, it's the, that you're asking the question um, when you're engaging with people, communities, you know, your job, you know, who is what I'm doing equitable? Is what I'm doing um, uh, uh, furthering anti-racist work? Um, and if the answer is no, then it's time to pivot and do something different. I mean, I think it's on the individual level. I think folks think that we are responsible for doing all of this. <laughs> Um, but it, it really isn't. It's, it's sort of a collective group of people that are willing to um, say, you know, this is a, a system that is broken and that it takes all of us to fix it. And I know that sounds so like 
cliche and kind of corny, but I think until people take individual responsibility for their role in, in why a space is not um, inclusive um, and the work and sort of take sort of that um, and, and, and decide what work they need to do to move forward the agenda, then um, I think we're going to be stuck for a while. Rosa Rodriguez Williams, I hope for continued success in your important endeavors towards diversity and inclusion work. Thank you so much for being a guest on the show today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. This was great. I hope you'll have me back. <laughs> Remember, you can listen to past episodes of The Power Play Show wherever you subscribe to podcasts, including iTunes, iHeartRadio, and now Pandora Music. You can also watch us on our YouTube channel. Simply search the Hull Bay Productions media channel and be sure to subscribe so you always know when we're live. And we air each Saturday at 5 p.m. on BroncoiRadio.com. So tune into a new episode each Thursday, wherever you subscribe to podcasts or on our YouTube channel, or simply visit thepowerplayshow.com. Until next time, I'm your host, Tonya McGrath, and thank you for tuning in.